Okay, let's see if I got a, this could be these in order. Uh, there we go. My email took it. You guys should just click on it. So I just click on here. Okay. There we go. Okay. So thank you for your patience. Um, it's a little slippery outside tonight and everybody's insisting on driving like the roads are dry. So I had to get around a couple of fender benders and wait for them to get off the road so I could go. But I want to welcome you and uh, uh, <clears throat> let's see, how, now how do I forward this to the next one? Right, right there. There we go. I'd like to take a minute to introduce everybody and I'll go pretty quickly tonight because one, I've got the uh, uh, slides out in the email and two, I, I lost a lot of time and I wanna give everybody else adequate time. Uh, I'm John Dolan. I'm a lifetime member of the Alaska Airmen Association and the uh, US, US, uh, US and Russia uh, liaison and one of the trip organizers for this, this flight. And I'll have some good news on the uh, flight status to share tonight too. We're still not a, a green light, but it is good news. Dan Billman, uh, I think will be with us. Dan, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thanks, Dan. Dan is basically our safety lead for the trip. And he was a pioneer developer of the flights and he's uh, retired, uh, retired from the FAA. And Dan, you were, a, a, what was your safety title with the FAA? I was the safety program manager for most of my career. Right. Okay. And Tandy, I saw you're here and uh, thank you for being here. Tandy is the owner of Circle Polar Expeditions. Both Dan and Tandy will be having a segment uh, a little later tonight uh, in their respective uh, expertise areas. Um, and uh, Andy McClure, are you with us tonight? I am, sir. Oh, man, you're a good man. <laughs> we weren't sure if he was going to be able to make it or not, but uh, he must have said hey, something, no right? Worries. <laughs> and Marshall, are you here? Okay. Yes, Marshall, I am Marshall. here. Oh, yep, okay. I'm hey, here. hey, Marshall. Uh, backing up to Andy, he's uh, FAA support liaison, and uh, he'll be talking a little bit tonight about some of the uh, FSS and FAA uh, services available to us. And Marshall is a, a trip advisor and uh, was also one of the developers of these flights. He's done it a few times. Uh, I had the good pleasure of uh, going with him in 2019 and we got to know him and then got weathered out. So, uh, but definitely good people. So uh, Marshall, feel free to jump in anytime uh, if you've got stuff. And then uh, I've got the rest of the other three on the agenda coming up. So first I wanna quickly review the purposes of our flight. Uh, they're pretty much the same every year, but we get new people every year. So it's important to set the tone. Uh, it's an adventure flight that uh, not a lot of people have completed, but you have the added safety and company of multiple aircraft and fellow aviators going along with you. Uh, and there's a possibility we'll have at least one amphibious aircraft going with us this year too, although that's not confirmed yet. That's an even uh, extra margin of safety. The second purpose is to validate uh, as the first group to use it, that the new uh, route we're gonna be using, Kilo Romeo 824 is operational. Uh, those of you who have gone before know we did um, uh, Bravo 369 and uh, that now has been shut down and replaced with uh, Kilo Romeo 824. It has some uh, added features that will be uh, good for us and we'll review them also. Uh, the actual route that we're gonna travel hasn't changed, but some of the parameters of the route have. Uh, the third one, and this is really important to us every year, we are a friendship flight as citizen goodwill ambassadors for both general aviation and Alaska. Uh, we wanna go over there and uh, uh, to stay way below the, the political and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I tell people we, we fly below the tweeter sphere. <laughs> but anyhow, we know there's a lot going on on both sides in the world. Um, but we're not going to get into that. We're going as citizen goodwill ambassadors to build bridges between Alaska and the Russian Far East. And finally, uh, we want to develop and maintain direct positive relationships with our relatives and neighbors in the Russian Far East. 
Yeah. Hey, Jackie. Can you answer this as Bob? Oops. Okay, sorry about that. So our goals for tonight's meeting, and, and we'll get through as many of them as we can, and then we'll uh, add on at the, the next meeting. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the overview of the flight. We already talked about the purpose. Uh, we'll talk about some personal decision-making considerations, responsibilities of each of the individuals that are going. Uh, Dan's gonna talk about safety considerations and uh, uh, we have visas, permits, requirements, and timelines, which, uh, uh, you know, either Tandy or I will cover it. I, I think Tandy is very well versed on them for the, the ground part. So I'm going to, you know, give Tandy a lot of space on that. Uh, I have some information on cost information. Everybody wants to know how much it's going to cost, and that's an important question. So we'll talk about that. Uh, and we'll talk about future projects and planning meetings. The idea of tonight's meeting in the big picture is to give you all enough information to start making the very serious uh, personal go and no go decision. Uh, is this a trip that you can and want to make? So I also want to share with you uh, a, a greeting from my Russian colleague that I that does our uh, flight services. And uh, <clears throat> His name is Evgeny, and he wrote a very nice letter to everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'll skip the salutations, but this is a letter to all of you. Recent changes in Russian aviation requirements open brand new possibilities for foreign general aviation. A lot's been changing over there since we went in 2019. Um, okay, simplified approval procedures and availability of Avgas, 100 low lead at the main airports in Russia. Also, I'll deviate and say for the for the first time that we've gone over, uh, 100 low lead is, it can be made available in Providenia. We'll talk about that later. But uh, airspace structure is also adapting to the needs of late general aviation. The new uh, route that I talked about has been established uh, from the IFR cross point Batney in the Bering Sea. Permitting flights now as low as 1,500 feet in some areas to Providenia. Uh, that certainly gives us a little more window of flexibility for the go/no-go no -go decision. Although I don't think that will uh, anybody here is interested in flying single engine at 1,500 feet over 60 miles of open water. But if, if there comes a uh, spot where we want to uh, go lower than 5,000, we have the option. Uh, okay, let's see. In December 2020, similar low-level BFR routes were finally opened from the neutral waters towards international airports of Anadir, Magadan, uh, Yuzno, Sakhalinsk, uh, Vladivostok, and Petropav, Petropavlovsk. Sorry, got to slow down here. Uh, it's exciting because these new routes make possible today VFR flights on purely BFR altitudes into Russian airspace. Uh, Avgas 100 low lead is permanently available and you can read the airports where they are. Further flights deeper into the country are also welcomed and destinations are countless. This is such a wonderful uh, uh, message from Russia that they not only uh, will permit it, but they welcome us. And in my personal interactions with Evgeny, I experience that every time we communicate. Avgas availability on the Kamchatka Peninsula is expected by this summer season. Uh, we are honored to be chosen as flight supporting agent for the 2021 flight to Providenia with flying and cultural program prepared for this trip to Russia to Kalka province. And Tandy will be doing a lot of the cultural stuff uh, and the ground stuff, and we'll get into that later. Uh, we believe our countries with only two nautical miles separating them between big and little diameter islands have now everything needed to develop the contacts between our people. Apart from the temporary pandemic restrictions, which we believe will be lifted by the end of May, there is literally nothing that prevents communication, contacts, and flying experience on the Russian side. On behalf of uh, MAK Aviation Services and AOPA Russia, please accept my warm welcome to Airmen from the United States about to visit our beautiful country. We are at your service to assist you in your flight preparations, planning, and fuel arrangements to enjoy your trip to Russia. With my very best regards, Evgeny Kabanov. And he's the C CEO of Mac Aviation Service, is who you'll learn about later. And they're doing, all, like I said, all of our flight permitting and arrangements. Uh, but that was just a, a 
very nice and generous letter from him. Okay, so let's see if I can figure out how to advance. There go. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over a lot of these quickly, but what you see in front of you now is the former route uh, Bravo 369, which we've flown every year we've done up until now. Uh, the last time we went was 2019 and then 2020 we were scrubbed uh, because of weather and pandemic, I mean, excuse me. So but that's just overview. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Bravo 369 and now Kilo Romeo E24 don't actually go all the way from the United States to Russia. Um, the route, I'm going to start calling it Kilo Romeo 824 because that's what we're using now. Uh, that route actually begins at Batney, the checkpoint that is just at the Diomede Islands, uh, immediately south of the uh, Diomede Islands. It's a Russian commuter route. So none of uh, Kilo Romeo 824 is in the United States. We fly uh, routine VFR from Nome to Batney. Uh, and I'll skip over this. You'll have the slides. Uh, just a couple of things. The longest distance, the total flight distance from Nome to Providenia is about 270 nautical miles, maybe 271 or two, but it's approximately 270 nautical miles one way. There are no fuel stops on the way, so you need to, uh, you know, have the capacity to make that distance with reserves. The longest distance over, over open water is 60 nautical miles. Um, so that's uh, another thing you have to consider with your personal limitations. Uh, Providenia time-wise is 20 hours ahead of Alaska during the summer months. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so the easy way to figure that out in the summer is whatever time it is in Nome, subtract four hours and that's what time it is the next day over in Russia. Okay. Interestingly enough, because we do cross the date line, on the return flight, you'll arrive uh, in Nome about 17 hours before you depart Providenia. <laughs> so that's just a fun little trivia fact. Okay. Uh, and uh, so as I said, it's a nonstop flight each way. But uh, for the first time, we've gone over, uh, let me reword that. Going over this time will be the first time that we've been able to arrange for 100 low lead fuel in uh, Providenia. We do have to order it a couple months in advance and uh, it's not cheap. It comes into the deep harbor on the barge. We'll talk about that some more later also, but there is uh, fuel available. I think it's like 13 to $15 a gallon, if I remember right. Uh, and it has to be ordered two months in advance. So the uh, route, we leave Nome, we fly northwest past Tin City to Wales. From Wales, we fly generally west to Batney, and then it's uh, Kilo Romeo 824. Uh, those of you who have done this years ago know that used to have a Russian navigator uh, translator uh, required on each plane, and that is no longer required. We've, uh, Russia's done away with that requirement uh, some time ago now. Okay. And this says ops in Russia are metric and ICAO, uh, although I remember seeing something not too far in the past that they are uh, changing some of their, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, measurements and guidelines. And we'll cover that in more detail on the, on the next meeting. Uh, what do we got? And we'll also help people with ICAO flight plans and recommended radio logs as we proceed and people get serious. Uh, I think more people this year than ever are familiar with ICAO flight plans because uh, I think we're using them more in the States now. Um, here's a slide that shows the uh, commuter, route, commuter route uh, Kilo Romeo A24. You can look at that at your own time. It shows the tracks and the altitudes. Uh, one thing I need to clarify is the width shows us four kilometers. And uh, I'll have to clarify that if that's four kilometers on either side or if that's a total of four kilometers, but we'll get that information to you. So there's a, uh, a chart you can look at that goes with the, uh, the rough maps that I made. So here's our proposed itinerary. Uh, right now we're looking at uh, gathering for a pilot's meeting on Saturday, May 29th. Uh, we did that Saturday evening last time. 
and just review everything, get our clearances, uh, make our go and no-go decisions, uh, and you know, become familiar with uh, uh, I think of customs. Become, become familiar with customs and what we have to do there and whatnot. Uh, plus, it's a good chance for us all to get together at the same time. Uh, so that'll it's not shown on here, but ideally that would happen Sunday evening, May 29th. Uh, the idea now is to depart. Now I'm reading the yellow column because that's all Alaska times. The idea is to depart on Sunday, May 30th. And typically uh, we've been leaving about 1.30 or so because we have to wait to get the weather from uh, Providenia. And the 270 nautical miles, you can uh, pretty much estimate your flight time, uh, two to three hours or so, and depending on what you're flying. Okay, we, we plan to be on the ground in Providenia uh, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, and then uh, depart from Providenia back to Nome on Wednesday, June 2nd, Alaska time in the afternoon. Uh, so that's uh, that's a, a quick review of the uh, of the uh, it draft itinerary. Uh, for the time that we're in Providenia, Tandy uh, basically is the master of all of this. Uh, she will be uh, handling food, lodging, uh, she does a great job putting together cultural experiences with the locals for us. And uh, um, I don't want to put her on too high a pedestal if she's afraid of heights, but uh, there is no pedestal high enough to review all of what she does for us. Uh, you're going to get to work with and enjoy working with Tandy for the ground stuff. Okay. Um, so. Okay, just to quickly touch on uh, the responsibilities of each participant in the flight. Uh, a lot of this is just common knowledge. The pilot in command or designee of each aircraft will be responsible for ensuring all coordination, permissions, regulatory compliance, uh, his or her personal individual go and no-go decision is, is acceptable to him or herself. And also all of the direct costs. To, to be clear, you know, the Alaska Airmen's Association doesn't charge anything and all of the work that we provide is, is basically volunteer service. You will build direct business relationships with um, Mac Gas over in, in Russia and with Tandy here. And also if we get to where we can get visas again with Red Star, uh, or whoever you choose to get your visa from. So uh, Airmen's Association doesn't handle any of the money at all. Uh, you will deal directly with each of our vendors, okay? And then again, we talked about earlier, but I, I just can't say it enough. All participants are responsible for being goodwill ambassadors to our host countries, people, and to each other. Uh, so we just want to uh, build bridges, okay? Uh, safety considerations. I'm going to skip over that because uh, Dan, I think, is going to talk about that later. And if we can come back to that slide if you want to. Let's talk about money. Everybody wants to know about money. Um, how's everybody doing? Any questions so far? We just finished the uh, group flight responsibility. That brings us to uh, Dan Billman and safety planning. So we will come back and talk about money uh, after Dan. Uh, but I want to stop here. And uh, Dan, I do have some um, uh, personal safety slides if you'd like me to put them up. But you are really good at uh, uh, covering this. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to you now and let me know if there's anything you need. Thank you, can you all hear me? Sound good here. We just lost you. Oop. Can you, uh, can you hear me now, Dan? No. Dan, you're muted. 
Yeah, I got a thumbs up from uh, Mr. Hansen. So, yeah, and I'm getting thumbs up from a few other people. So perhaps you're muted, Dan? Yeah, Alt-A will generally enable your microphone. Well, he's doing that. Uh, I don't know if you got to meet and talk to uh, uh, Jackie a couple minutes ago while I was on the road. Hold down your space bar. <laughs> Not yet, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? Okay. What we can do if you need more time to play with it, Dan, is I can uh, do the part about costs, and that'll give you time to. Uh, uh, yeah, I see your lips move. Cold Pink Floyd, your lips move, but I can't hear what you say. So. Bottom left, uh, little microphone. You just got to click that. I don't know yep. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. yay. Oh, we had you. Now it's red again. Enable it and then leave it alone. <laughs> you see the there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. There you go. Okay, good. Well, let's talk about <laughs> some of the safety involved <laughs> in flying from Fairbanks or Anchorage. Uh, first of all, we've got a big state to fly across. So it's important to handle your fuel properly. Um, when Marshall and I flew in 2017, we had to go uh, up through Isabel Pass and a more up interior route. So we stopped in Tanana, we got gas in Galena, then we got gas over in uh, Unalakleet, and then of course in, uh, in Nome. So it's important, Marshall's, we chose to go on Marshall's uh, 172, it had a, um, an extra ON tank, 18-gallon uh, tank in the baggage compartment. And then we carried uh, two other five-gallon pails of, of fuel. <clears throat> uh, but um, so that's up to the type of aircraft you guys have, of course, and, and your, your flight planning. But it's important to think about the fuel and think about the fuel from Nome to Providenia and back. Um, now, uh, John was talking about the 60 nautical miles of water. So uh, that's a little more than we're used to, of course, uh, generally. So it's real critical um, that we have good survival, a good survival raft, I believe. Uh, also on that list I saw for a moment there was uh, Marshall and I had talked that we thought uh, helmets would be a good idea if you ever did uh, ditch that aircraft out there. Uh, helmets might protect you from some sort of an injury that would allow you to get out of the aircraft and get into your raft. Um, we also suggest, uh, of course, life vests, but also probably dry suits. Uh, a dry suit with a good neck and, and cuffs and, and booties would protect you from that cold water for, for a long time and time to get into a raft and and have a way better chance of survival. And Dan, Dan um, if I can interject for just a moment, uh, if anybody needs a kind of a bone chilling um, wake up call on that, uh, live ATC, the live ATC recording of the 170 that went down, uh, down in Washington State is online. And there's just nothing like listening to live time pilot recording calling Mayday, Mayday, and then talk about he is going in the water right now. Uh, that's a pretty good wake up call. So. You know, and so often, I don't know about that particular accident, but a lot of times uh, here in Anchorage, we've had a lot of people returning to the Anchorage area or Birchwood and run out of fuel in or near the inlet. And uh, so it's just, uh, 
you can't be at the bottom of the gauges when you're trying to trying to cross a big uh, water expanse. Um, there's uh, there are dry suits available for rental uh, and purchase, uh, but I, you know so they're available out there. Alaska Outdoor Rental rents them on Potter Drive. Uh, REI has some for sale. Some of the uh, dry suits that windsurfers would use uh, may be adequate. They, they don't have quite as strong of a neck uh, uh, gasket, but they would keep, they will keep most of the water away from you and, and uh, they're a little more reasonable. Um, REI is another good source of that kind of equipment. Now, um, one thing that I think is so important is uh, some people still don't have 406 ELTs. And uh, to me, uh, that would be uh, super important for a flight like that. And also how many different pockets you have to put personal locator beacons in, you know, uh, and or uh, tracking equipment. Uh, tracking devices that you, uh, someone at home or someone that can flight follow you can see you're tracking the whole way over and back. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of doing this on a, you know, an overview. And uh, as we get closer, we can probably do that again, but I can probably save some time for you, John and uh, kind of hold it there unless there's some questions out there. Uh, how about questions for Dan? On the, uh, on the uh, uh, flight service ESRS program, uh, Andy's gonna talk to you about that in a little bit, but oh, good. Uh, go ahead, questions? Okay, uh, I will add a reminder, my contact information is readily available and uh, our presenters tonight, I have their contact information at the end of the show also. So if you think of questions later, you know, I always get off the air and I think, oh darn, I meant to ask this. Uh, if that happens, you have a way to get hold of, of us by email and whatnot. Uh, we want to be free with information, not selfish with it. So, uh, okay. So thank you very much, Dan, I appreciate that. And yes. uh, I'm still working out the, the mechanics of, uh, of uh, this program too. So how do I turn these people off, move these people off to this? Hit there? Oh, okay. Okay, that won't work. Okay, I'm trying to get to my uh, documents here, my slides. Uh, Andy, this uh, I'm going to jump the agenda order because it seems more logical at this point to uh, dive into the um, ESRS program and flights. You know, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Andy McClure from the FAA. Okay, uh, thanks, John, <clears throat> and sorry to uh, preempt you there, Tandy. Uh, your stuff's a lot more interesting than mine, but <laughs> okay, um, she's, she's further down on the agenda, so she's coming up. Okay. You're going to do yours. Good I'm going to do an overview of costs, and uh, and then Tandy's going to have the floor for a big chunk of time. So okay, you're on. I'll Andy. be as quick as I can. Um, Alaska, for those of you who are not in Alaska right now or have never flown up here, uh, still has 17 FAA flight service stations. Um, three of them are what we call hub facilities, uh, Juneau, Fairbanks, and Kenai, Alaska. But we have 14 remote facilities, including one at Nome that has done a lot of uh, VFR to Russia flights over the years and is a pretty good resource. Uh, right now, due to COVID considerations, uh, over-the-counter briefings, which 
some of us older pilots might remember are not available, unfortunately. Um, as soon as the COVID restrictions are lifted, um, we'll try and get the word out through John. Um, hopefully that'll be sometime real soon. Uh, the ESRS program, which John mentioned, um, hopefully uh, those of you here in Alaska have heard of this. It uses satellite tracking devices to um, attach to your flight plan, basically a track that flight service uh, can then look at if you don't show up in a uh, at the appropriate time uh, at the end of your uh, journey, or if uh, you have a satellite tracking device and all of the ones that are part of our program have an SOS button on them. If you push that SOS button and you're enrolled in the ESRS, uh, our next phone call is to the Rescue Coordination Center and they will immediately launch out to the area where you press the SOS. And that cuts down uh, search and rescue search areas to several magnitudes, uh, smaller areas. Um, just as a, for instance, uh, I put together an example of a flight uh, from Anchorage out to a mining claim somewhere over the Alaska range and back um, just by being a, a little liberal with the routing, uh, came up with an, a search area that might be as big as 25,000 square miles, which even for the Air Force can take a while. Uh, with the use of one of these satellite tracking devices, uh, you can cut that to about 25 to 30 square miles. So you can see they're going to they're gonna get to where you are and have a much smaller area to search and hopefully get you home in time for dinner. So strongly recommend that if you're coming up to Alaska and you haven't done that, uh, you can get a hold of any flight service station up here by looking up a phone number in the Alaska chart supplement and they can get you signed up for ESRS. Uh, the four devices that we are enabled for at the moment, uh, the Garmin inReach, uh, the spot tracker, spider tracks, and uh, just this year we added um, a device by a company called Track Plus uh, that is called the Rock Air. And all of these things have some pretty cool uh, features to them. One of the best is that if you have a satellite, um, satellite tracker, you can generally Bluetooth it to your smartphone and you can in effect text anybody you want to from pretty much anywhere on the planet, which is a real advantage. You know, if you land and everybody's okay, you can describe exactly what's going on or, you know, if things aren't quite as okay, you can also describe exactly what's going on and people will come to you prepared uh, rather than just you know searching in a C-130 or in a Sikorsky helicopter. So um, that is, is one of the best things we have going. Um, I strongly recommend that people review special VFR procedures. If you're not used to doing a special VFR, um, most of the flight service stations here in Alaska have Class E airspace and a surface area all the way to the ground. So if and when the weather goes down, which it has a tendency to do, especially in the summertime with uh, coastal stratus, you may find yourself on the return flight having to fly under a fairly low ceiling uh, to get back into Nome. And just being you know, prepared in your mind for all the contingencies is a pretty cool thing. Uh, the chart supplement, the Alaska chart supplement that I mentioned a little while ago, instead of the green books that they have down south, we have a sort of salmon colored, we like to call it, uh, chart supplement. Uh, there's quite a bit of stuff in there about the 
uh, Alaska to Russia uh, procedures and routing. Unfortunately, because uh, KR-824 was just introduced and the charts haven't quite caught up to that yet, uh, some of the stuff in the chart supplement is a little out of date, but not all of it. Uh, the route is still essentially identical. Um, we're gonna get those things updated as soon as we can. I'm uh, eagerly waiting for February 21st this year when the new Gnome sectional comes out. Uh, due to Marshall's efforts a couple of years ago, there is an inset on the Western end of the Gnome sectional that includes the Northeastern corner of Russia all the way down to Providenia. Uh, we've been bugging the charting office to get KR 824 on there and hopefully they've got that done. Uh, if you haven't heard though, uh, all the sectional charts are going to be updated on a 28 day basis, just like uh, en route charts for IFR travel. Uh, this is something they're starting February 21st this year. So could be kind of interesting, but you might want to keep looking at the sectionals to uh, hopefully very soon find KR 824 on the western side of the Gnome sectional. Uh, let's see. Um, real, real quick, Andy, while you're thinking, what was the yeah. company that put out the Rock Air Tracker? Uh, I believe it's called Track Plus. Okay, thanks. T R A C P L U S. Thanks. And that's the the newest of the satellite tracker devices that we've uh, included in the ESRS, and it's it's got some pretty slick stuff going on there. Um, the in company my name is Rock Seven. I still had it. Sorry, go ahead. The company name is Rock Seven. Two words. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're, they're so new, I think they keep changing things a little bit back and forth. Um, I had a spider tracks in my 172 and absolutely loved it. Um, a lot of people have in reach and spot. The thing to remember with spot is that once you get up into far northern latitudes, spot has a harder time getting satellites. Uh, it works, uh, the other, the three systems in reach spider tracks and, and uh, track plus or rock air, um, they all work with iridium and get terrific coverage up at Northern latitudes. Uh, Spot works with a company called Global Star and they don't have nearly as much coverage above like uh, 65 degrees North maybe, it gets a little spotty. I haven't heard any feedback. Marshall, do you know uh, if they've ever been able to close that gap over the water? Back in, uh, what about 2018, I think when you went, there was a, a spot, yeah, a gap, spot had a gap in coverage that is directly over the open water. Um, have you heard if that was ever repaired or not? Uh, what it was, was that uh, there's, uh, they've got, uh, these earth stations. They've got one actually in Wasilla, and the next one's over in Korea. And what happened is that the, the uh, tracking, the, the tracking data did not transition from one station to the other. So what me and Dan experienced was a big dropout over the Bering Sea. And uh, they they were became aware of it through us. And uh, at the time they had requested uh, you know some feedback, uh, but I don't know that anybody has actually transitioned with a spot device to. Uh, verify that uh, the, that the, the, mm. the uh, transition will take place. Yep. So they, ours did work on both sides, but uh, you know, it was, it was quite the gap in the middle there. Thank you. Thank you. I know we had two in reaches in our plane in 2019 and, and the coverage was just a hundred percent both in the air and on the ground. Um, so I have, a, I have a bit of a bias just from experience. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Um, the, Can the, I add one thing more? Certainly. Okay. Um, on the, uh, uh, on these two devices, devices and the newest one, I don't know 
anything about actually. But uh, one thing to remember too, and, and John, when you pointed out the, the uh, aircraft pilot that uh, went down there in Washington off offshore, is that uh, these devices they uh, they have certain intervals that they give breadcrumbs or signals at position reports. But uh, obviously, when you're in the air and you have an emergency, you've probably got time to hit a button, you know, the SOS button, and but the point I'd like to get across is most of these devices that accelerate, it's not two minutes, five minutes, or whatever. It's, it's just an incredible amount, uh, depending on what the unit is, of uh, signals, you know, right down as far as the, the coverage goes. So it's much more than, uh, you know, an SOS situation. It's much more than, well, we had a position report five minutes ago. Uh, so the search area is really reduced. There you go. Thank you. Thank just, you, Marshall. Just to just to touch uh, backtrack a little bit real quickly, if you hadn't heard that there was a Cessna 170 that went down immediately off the coast of Port Angeles uh, a couple days ago and the Coast Guard's done an exhaustive search for two days with no finding, but that called off the search. So that's that's the uh, incident we were just talking about. So, yep. um, and that's where, you know, something a uh, satellite tracker can come in real handy. Uh, at least it narrows down that search area to a, a huge degree. The one one last thing I would like to mention, John, if I could. Sure, absolutely. Um, on the return flight from Russia to the U.S., it's very important to get in contact with Gnome Radio uh, prior to reaching Batney so you can get a DVFR squawk. Uh, DVFR, if you've never done it, is Defense VFR Rules. It identifies you for NORAD as you're coming back into the States. Uh, that way you don't make a whole bunch of friends, new friends wearing blue suits when you arrive in Nome. Yeah. I'm, I'm always referring to uh, not wanting to meet up with MIGs or F-22s that have follow me signs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so Highly much. I highly recommend that, that DVFR squawk. And that's all I got, John, unless anybody has any questions. Questions for Andy. Okay. And okay. if you think of stuff later, or, you know, uh, I intend to be on more of these meetings, and I will certainly be available for follow up. Or, uh, John, you're completely authorized to give out my FAA email address. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna really go fast through the cost overview because I'm stepping on Andy's time already and we'll add, add more time on the back end for her because she's one of our key people. But just to give you an idea of money, um, you can read these all in your own time, but expenses you're gonna be dealing with will be the uh, passport. And you do have to get the book. The passport card is not valid for travel to and from Russia. So. Another note on your passport is it must be valid for at least six months after your scheduled departure date. Um, I've heard all sorts of theories about why that is. And, and uh, <laughs> just in case they decide you want to stay longer, for example. <laughs> but, but bottom line is your passport must be valid for six months after your uh, scheduled date of departure. Okay, the Russian visa right now, unfortunately, uh, Russian visa applications from the United States and many other countries are simply not being processed. Um, so that may be a, a deal breaker for uh, people who don't have a visa already, um, but we're hopeful and uh, uh, they'll notify us as soon as, um, you know, as soon as they are processing them again. Uh, but uh, we've dealt with a contractor, Red Star down in Seattle and, and I've never had a problem with them, and as far as I know, nobody else has either. Um, but we recommend the three-year multi-visit tourist visa, and it's about $450. Usually takes about 14 days, but you can pay extra and expedite it when, whenever they're, excuse me, whenever they're processing them. Okay, um, so the aviation related permissions, flight plans, and flight handling, uh, we go through uh, MAC, GAS stands for General Aviation Services. I just call it MAC GAS. Uh, and very nice company to deal with. They're based in Moscow, 
Uh, I'm in regular contact with them. And if you decide you're going, you will be as well. Um, but uh, it could easily run 650 to $1,000 or more per aircraft. I have one sample flight I'm gonna share with you shortly. Uh, remember your aircraft customs decal uh, and your FCC, you have to have an FCC radio station license for international travel. And together those run about $200. I'll have links uh, at the end of the presentation if you need to follow up on them. Uh, now we're getting into Tandy's expertise and, and so I'm gonna skip over because she'll talk more. But you have a, a Chicota border entry permit, letter of invitation and ground permissions, room and board, you know, all of your ground amenities and cultural activities. And that's why I'm kind of rushing through so to give Tandy as much time as possible. And then of course, whatever the care and feeding of your aircraft is gonna cost you, okay? Uh, expenses in Nome, uh, you can read through that on your own. I'm gonna skip to the example. It's easy for this trip to run to $5,000. Uh, so here's a sample uh, flight based on 2019 experiences. And as you look through these, keep in mind in 2019, we made two attempts. We got as far as Nome and then couldn't go. And we had, it took us two weeks to get another window of opportunity. And then we did successfully go. Uh, we all flew back to our wherever we were staying and, and left Nome for that two weeks. So um, um, the, the Nome lodging, two nights for two people ran uh, about $510 in this example. Uh, and uh, I know the pilot that did this is on, is on here tonight. So if you wanna add anything, feel welcome to. I just kept it anonymous, but um, just uh, I, I just tend to protect people's privacy, but feel free to jump in. Okay, meals, uh, four meals were $135. Uh, you can do cheaper. There are groceries available uh, in Nome. Uh, and then the taxi uh, about estimated at $40. Uh, what the taxis do in Nome is five to seven dollars a ride, uh, depending on distance, and that's per person. They're very friendly. They're almost always very fast. Uh, but if two of you are sharing a cab, you're going to spend uh, five dollars to seven dollars each on on the trip. So ten to fourteen dollars, and that that will cover you all the way from the airport up through town and all the way out to the beach uh, out at the end, out towards the end of the road. Uh, Avgas uh, in this particular 182 from Nome to Providenia to Nome was about $470. Uh, the visas, two visas, one for each of them was about $915. And I rounded these out. Uh, the flight services, that year we used uh, Skyplan and it's the first year we tried uh, MacGas and they subcontract, we subcontracted them through Skyplan and it went so well that now we go exclusively with Mac. Uh, they give very good service. Uh, in our experience, they were getting responses and permits back to us faster and cheaper. So Skyplan did an excellent job. I don't want to badmouth Skyplan at all. They're based in Canada, uh, but we've just been very pleased to, with Mac Gas. And Evgeny is the one who wrote that nice letter to us at the beginning. So, so the flight services, uh, the flight services were about $1,100, and that covered the one aborted attempt and the completed attempt. And then the ground services, it's Tandy, and there's no way in the world Tandy can, uh, speaking for you, Tandy, I'm sorry, no way in the world at this point she can tell us what it's going to cost. There's a lot of variables there. But in 2019, with the two attempts, it was $1,800 for two people. Um, but as I said, I can't say it enough, Tandy delivers. So uh, so that just gives you an idea, a rundown. Uh, the total for this 2019 example was just under $5,000. Um, does anybody have questions or comments to add to that before I move on? Hey, John, this is Marshall. Just yeah. a quickie, when, when you talked about, uh, you know, uh, the weather holes and that sort of thing too, is that you and I just barely made it out of Nome Yes, we do. Because of volcanic activity, too. And I mean, the flight service was talking about it. I mean, they were actively soliciting pilot reports because it was definitely heading our way. So it was actually really good that we got out of there rather than staying there and being stuck even more with the airplane getting dusted. 
Absolutely. We were we were debating to stay one more day and then we decided, well, that's just, you know, we know we're not going tomorrow too, so why waste the money? So yeah, we jumped in Marshall's plane and away we went. And right after we launched, we were hearing on the radio that the volcanic ash was moving our way quickly and had already gotten as far as Savunga. So that's a, that's a, a good example, Marshall, of some of the kinds of delays, you never know what you're going to expect. The original weather delay was just uh, low ceilings and, and rain over on the Russian side. But then this uh, volcano down in the Kuril Islands blew and, and that ash cloud just made tracks up towards Nome. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that, Marshall. Uh, folks you know, who don't live with volcanic ash might not think of that. They're, they're just amazing how many different kinds of unforeseeable delays can come up even after you've spent the money. Uh, so thank you. Anybody else? I have a question. Good evening. This is Petra. Sorry, oh, I said Petra, I'm glad you made it. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I want to give a shout out to Petra because behind the scenes, she has been giving me a lot of helpful feedback <laughs> and, and helped make this even better. So thank you, Petra. I, I felt like I was torturing you. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. When I get to thinking I know it all and I don't need feedback, somebody slapped me upside the head. Okay. <laughs> I had to. Thank you, John. I joined a little late because of work conflicts, but um, so you may have covered this, but regarding visas and passports, mm -hmm. um, in 2003, we were caught short with a specific document um, and it had, and I'm not sure of the exact name of the document, but um, at that time, um, this area was a closed border zone mm. and it required, in addition to a passport, Mm -hmm. And a tourist visa, it required a border permit of some sort. That, that, sounds, we didn't like the, that sounds like the Chukotka border, maybe? It could be, yeah. And, and it causes some problems. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that an additional, is, is that no longer required? Or um, is that an additional permit that we need to be aware of? That was a beautiful segue into uh, Tandy Wallach. So okay. <laughs> that, that's her expertise. So, uh, and real quick, before we go to Tandy, any other questions? Um, that's a good one. Okay, Tandy, uh, I didn't get the, the slide you were gonna send me. So we kind of, we'll look at all, I'll look at each other, but you've got the floor now for, oh, easily 15, 20 minutes if you need it. Okay. Um... Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, John and the Airmen's Association for arranging this uh, Zoom meeting so we can get a kickoff early on our plan to fly over to uh, Chukotka. Uh, it's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces and names. You know, we've got Mike, uh, Mark Dudley. Uh, we have Dan, who's sitting in again. He went with us before. Uh, Bob Klein, who uh, I think he takes the award for being able to pack the most into a, a small aircraft. It's amazing what that man did. Werner from Canada, I think, is on the line. So it's just good to see familiar faces uh, to do this again. So John asked me to give uh, a little overview of the Russian Far East and then some cultural information and then I'll address uh, services and like what you were asking there, uh, Petra. So first of all, the Russian Far East, I can't talk without a map, but just pretend it, there's the map and here we have Russia on one. Oop, you locked up, Tandy. 68, 80, 67, Tsarist Russia, uh, it was a czar, uh, uh, sold Alaska to the United States government. Okay. So we naturally had a border there, but that border was not really enforced until after uh, the war and the Cold War began. So in 1948, the Russians started enforcing the border between Alaska and the Russian Far East. And it, we call it here in Alaska and, and maybe other places call it too. But what happened is it was, it was an ice wall that was between uh, Alaska and, and Russia. 
And so you never really ever thought about going that way because you knew you couldn't go that way because of Russia and their ice wall. So anyway, in the late 80s, some folks in Nome wanted to try and connect with the folks over in Chukotka. And for cultural reasons, for native people and their relatives and everything like that. And it's a long, wonderful story. And Jim Stemple will probably meet us in Nome and tell you about how he sent a little air balloon up with a note in it to go over to Russia and say it was mere peace, peace. Well, his balloon didn't go over to Russia. It landed on the beaches in Nome. And somebody comes around, the Russians have come, the Russians have come. And Jim says, no, that's mine. So Jim Stimple is an intricate person in moving forward with uh, opening up that border. So in 89, Alaska Airlines decided to do uh, a Russian friendship flight. And they uh, flew their uh, big jet over to Providenia. And it's the same airport that we fly into. It really hasn't changed much. But anyway, that sort of started things opening up and loosening down a little bit. 91, uh, Alaska uh, filed scheduled service over to Magadan and Habaris and, and then PKC and, and then uh, Usulin, Sakhalin Usnuk because of the oil development. So it was like here in Alaska, it was like Russian fever. You know, many, many people went over on Alaska Airlines little uh, four day, five day trip over there as tourists and they came back businessmen and they all wanted to do a business over in Russia. And so they were doing all kinds of exchanges. And then in 98, uh, the Russian economy failed dramatically. So a lot of that stuff just went away. Those airlines uh, stopped flying, Aeroflot, Reeve, uh, Alaska Airlines, and they had only charters, Bering Air out of Nome, and then Mark Dougley's uh, uh, charter flight came in. So it's, it's just up and down with the Russian Far East. And that's, a lot of that can be politics and most of it is, but the people, the people that we're dealing with on the ground, it hasn't changed much. They still want us to come. They're still opening their arms to us. And so that keeps me going. You know, I mean, somebody asked, why do you work in Russia? And I go, you know, it's the people. <laughs> they are wonderful, wonderful people. And if you get beyond the politics, then uh, we can do these kinds of exchanges. So that being said, um, there were a lot of uh, cultural events, exchanges back and forth with kids and, and church and uh, cultural dance groups going back and forth. But so many of that, I mean, Marshall can tell you, has all gone away. So there really isn't much going on between Alaska and Russia, particularly now. We're in the pandemic. But even prior to the pandemic, it sort of has started to freeze up a little bit. And uh, so their restrictions have been increased. Uh, so just to let you know that in, in Russia right now, we have an embassy in Moscow. We have no consulates in Vladivostok or anywhere else where we used to have five consulates and that would keep that border going in trade. So now we only have one in Moscow. And as John said right now, uh, the, the Russians are not issuing visas, Russian visas. So that's always the first thing that we talk about in a planning meeting like this is get your passport, make sure you have enough pages on it and it's valid for six months after you arrive back from uh, Russia. And uh, that's the first process. And then once you get to your passport, then we, we start with the permissions in Chukotka. And like Petra said, there, over the years, those uh, restrictions have changed. And what she, she was talking about at that time, they had a, uh, a border permit and they still have this, 
for pilots, if, like Bear and Air, when they fly over there, they can only stay in the airport. They, they can't go into town at all. I mean, we wanted to bring our pilot in there and let him take a look at Providenia, but he can't. So there's that one restriction. Then the other one is the Chukotka permission that we have to, to gain. And that one uh, allows us to go into Chukotka. They wanna know where we're going and who we're staying with, who's doing our services, which we all provide uh, for that. Normally that takes 60 days to get that permission. And in order to file that, I have to have your uh, passport number, I have to have your Russian visa. And then we, we put in for the Chukotka permission. Um, we haven't been uh, refused anyone in a long, 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 long time of getting the Chukotka permission. So I don't foresee that as a problem, but I'm an optimist, okay? Now I'm in touch with uh, the, uh, the US State Department. I'm in touch with the Chukotka uh, government officials. I'm in contact with tour international tourism agencies and uh, trying to figure out what's going to go on. Okay, if you take it a snapshot today, forget it. You can't go to Russia right now, whether you had a visa or a Chukotka permission or even a, a safe COVID uh, test. You can't go. That's it. But being an optimist, who knows what's going to happen? You know, Russia changes. And even though they have these permissions that are, have been hardcore in the past, well, sometimes they can wave that kind of a thing. So I'm not discouraged that we will not be able to go over there. I'm still going ahead as if we're, we are gonna go because they can change the rules uh, right away if, if they want it to happen. And why do they want it to happen? Because of what John was talking about, you know, the, the goodwill uh, ambassadors that we are. We go over there as regular citizens and we are trying to be goodwill ambassadors, whether it's with the government, with the school kids, with the native organizations, anyone, uh, carvers that are over there, whaling commissions that are over there, we're all, all in contact with them. And I've been in contact with them all the time. And so they're, they want us to come, but we have to wait to see what is gonna play out here. Now, uh, one of the other things I just want to mention, I was just on a tourism COVID um, committee that was talking about COVID here in Alaska with tourism and all that kind of a thing. And as we know, when you come into Alaska, you have to have a valid COVID test. And then you have to, uh, if you don't live here, seven, day, seven days uh, quarantine and then you have to go and get another test and all that kind of a thing. So it's a big rigmarole. But as people are getting vaccinated here in Alaska, uh, things are changing. And a lot of the uh, airlines and the cruise companies are talking about the rapid testing. And how will it be for a private pilot to fly into Alaska? What are the rules for that? Where do they hunker down? Do they have to hunker down? All of these are unknown factors, but we're watching them and we are still hopeful that we're gonna be able to go. So, I mean, one thing that I just wanna, this particular meeting is uh, trying to get your excitement up about the possibility of doing a lifetime adventure to a, an area that is very remote. Uh, I mean, you might think, oh, well, it's right over there, but it's not right over there. I mean, it'd be easy if it was, you know, in the US or if it was in Canada. It's like I said to Marshall some years ago when he was planning to go. And, you know, what I love about Marshall is that he's so safety conscious and that he has uh, all the answers. If this happens, that happens, this happens, that happens. He has it all right there. And I said to him at one point, I said, um, if, if, that, if Providenia was over in Canada, would you hesitate to go? And he said, absolutely not. You know, so the flying over there, I'm not a pilot, but the flying over in Chukotka is no different than flying over here. It's the rules and the regulations uh, that apply. So um, 
a lot of people ask me, oh, can you go in a single aircraft over there and all of that kind of, certainly, you know, you can, you just have to be safe about it. So um, what, I, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention besides uh, partnering with the mayors of Providenia and the governor's office, we are partnered with the Beringia International Park. Well, it's the Beringia Russian Park over there. And I've worked with them for years and they provide the services uh, for our ground handling in certain locations. And so, you know, we are connected over there in Chukotka. And uh, I just think, you know, with positive thinking and prayers that things will get back a little bit to normal, we'll be able to go. Uh, my role in this is to help you uh, proceed with getting your Russian visa, if you need help with your passport. We do the lodging, we do the meals, culture adventures. I mean, if there's something specific, uh, let's say you're a school teacher. Well, you know, we, we, we set up school meetings when we were in Providenia to talk to the school kids about aviation and flying. So, um, you know, just let us know what you might like to do and we'll try and set it up for you. So. I hope that answers your questions. Uh, so let me know. Thanks. Andy, thank you so much. You cover so much in such a, a brief time. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'd say your contact information will be there also. So uh, uh, we want to, I don't, just so you all know, I don't need to be the middleman in everything that's going on. It's nice to have a thumb on the pulse and know who's doing what, but it, you don't have to go through me to talk to Tandy or to uh, Matt Gass or anybody else. Uh, just, you know, do your business directly with them. So, okay. I want to talk briefly, but I touch on one thing briefly that uh, Tandy talked about, and that is COVID. Uh, this is uh, the Alaska uh, cases as of yesterday. And uh, what's that? Okay. My IT expert is, is guiding me down the footpath here. Thank you. So, um, and as you can see, uh, it was really getting out of hand in December when uh, I was saying it's not looking promising, but we're gonna plan anyhow. And what's happened since December shows you pretty clearly why we plan and, and make the assumption that we're going. Uh, it's gonna be a, a fabulous, exciting trip. I, I urge people to, to consider going. Uh, I've been talking with uh, folks in Russia and I am, I am told that uh, they're pretty optimistic also. Uh, three things I had restrictions, which now the vaccines are making the rounds, uh, we hopefully will see that continue to drop. Uh, but who can say? Uh, the socio-political status, if you've watched any of the news, you know that things are kind of rumbling uh, socially and politically in both countries. Um, you know, Russia has had a few things going on that were disruptive for them. And, uh, you know, I heard on the news that we had something going on that was disruptive to us. <laughs> I'm being facetious, of course. Uh, the good news is that, you know, there's a, I think there's a good chance, an improve, increasing chance that we're going to see our political stuff stabilized. And uh, uh, at this point, it's not impacting our ability to uh, leave and reenter the country anyhow. Uh, so, and, and uh, I'm assured, <laughs> as only Russia can assure me, their political uh, instability will not affect our trip. <laughs> so, so they're pretty confident about that. And actually what's going on over there isn't immediately in the area we want to go to anyhow. But uh, it's very optimistic reporting that that's not going to uh, impact our trip. And then the last thing is that our Department of State uh, last I checked a few days ago, still has a, uh, a level four uh, travel alert for Americans traveling to Russia. Level four is the highest they've got. It means do not travel. 
the primary motivator for that was the COVID-19 business. It was not sociopolitical. So uh, as you look at this graph that was just put out yesterday by Alaska, uh, this is what's happening in Alaska. Um, you know, there's reason to start getting more optimistic than I have been when I'm talking to people and I'm, I'm feeling justified in making the decision to keep planning on going. So I just wanted to share that, that uh, new note of optimism for you. Um, what I got next here? Oh, that's the agenda. Okay. Uh, is that my last slide? That is my next slide. Oh. Okay, I'm going to skip the, uh, the, well, let's see how much time we have. I wanted to leave time for question and answer at this point. Do we have any questions and answers? Or do we have any questions that we can provide answers for? Uh, while I'm looking for my other slides. Anything you all want to know about you haven't heard about yet? Is, is there a limit on uh, the number of people that can go? And is it still possible to, to sign up or join the crowd? Good question. It absolutely is still possible. And if you're not on my interested persons list already, um, shoot me an email and I will make sure you get on to get all the notifications. Um, I'm, looking, I'm looking for a slide here. It will be down near the end. Thanks. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, can slides be made available? The slides are available. Um, I mailed them out to all of the people tonight who are on the interested persons list. And uh, uh, if you're not on the interested persons list, feel welcome to uh, uh, email me and I'll add you. Also, uh, my IT wizard here is going to post this. Is it going to be on YouTube? Yeah. Okay. So it will be posted on YouTube. Uh, so that anybody who couldn't make it tonight or anybody that wants to go back and revisit some of this will have access to it after tonight. But uh, if you would like us to email you the slides, uh, just make sure I have your contact information, okay? So that brings us, that's a nice segue to contact information. Okay, uh, as you can see on this slide, my information is on there. Uh, and... Uh, and then Dan Billman, who is our safety lead, he talked early on in the meeting. Uh, and then contact information for Matt Gass is on there. Evgeny is just a wonderful guy to deal with. Uh, email works really well with him. Uh, and Tandy, well, you know Tandy now if you didn't know her before. She's, uh, she's our, our gold mine of uh, creating experiences while we're over there. And Tandy, is that the right contact information for you still? Yes. Okay, thanks. And then uh, let's see, what do we got? Uh, Andy, let's see, I'm, this is pretty late. I'm having trouble reading it, but uh, make sure. Right I'm, there at the bottom. Yeah, I just, I want to make sure I had the right email address there. So oh, okay. yep. uh, Andy, can help, Andy can help you with uh, uh, master, the master flight program uh, when you get to Alaska and the ESRS. Uh, information, anything that the FAA and the FAA, FSS uh, services provide, there's Andy's contact information as well. So, uh, like I say, we want to uh, share and be open with our information, not keep it secretive and, and hidden. Okay, some more contact information, U.S. passport, Russian visa, and uh, information about U.S. Customs departure and return info. We're going to talk more about customs uh, at our next meeting because there's some important things to cover about what you can and cannot. Uh, whoops, you, know, you can and cannot uh, uh, take with you. And maybe that was my last slide. Um, it's 29 and 30. My eyes aren't what they used to be. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, okay, so 30 was my, 29 and 30 were my last key contacts. So let's, so let's go back to talk briefly on uh, permissions and paperwork. Okay, you'll have these slides also, so I'm gonna breeze through them quickly, but uh, if you need a passport, uh, as Tandy mentioned, make sure you get it now. 
uh, and it has and check the expiration date on your passport. It has to be valid uh, at least six months past your travel dates and have two blank visa pages. Uh, the Russian visa, as soon as you have your valid passport, uh, get your apply for a Russian visa if they're processing them. Uh, you've got uh, the contact information for Red Star down below. Uh, that, as I said, under normal circumstances was taking about 14 days and you could pay more to expedite it. Uh, okay. And, uh, okay. John, could I just mention something about the Please. Russian visa there? Please, um, go ahead. On the application, you do it online and they have certain questions on there that sometimes um, scares people because uh, they're just so, in, oh, I don't know, intrusive. I mean, it's like, what is your kindergarten's mother's name? You know, some really outrageous questions that would be unusual for us. You also uh, need, you'll need me to provide you with uh, the name and the address and the contact information in Chukotka. So if you're ready to do your Russian visa, just get a hold of me so I can give you that information. Thanks. There you go. Um, and they ask about your criminal background. And so, uh, you know, if you have some questions about, you know, what might be a problem, what might be a problem and how to report it, uh, Tandy is a, a great resource for that as well. So, uh, uh, don't be bashful. I, I'd hate to have somebody get over there or apply and then get denied because of something that done differently. <laughs> okay, uh, so, oh, uh, somebody's, uh, Eric Ernest, I'm sorry, is asking about the answer to the basic med question. Uh, I will research that again. The last I looked at that, uh, basic med is not uh, valid for flying to Russia. Um, I think Canada and Mexico are on board now. I'm not positive, but uh, basic med, uh, I have never heard of anything uh, about it being valid in Russia. I will follow up. Uh, that's earnest. And, and a lot of what I do, uh, those of you who are on the interested person list get my periodic uh, update memos, and I will include all of these answers also. If you, anybody ever asks a question and it doesn't get answered, don't be bashful about dropping me a text or an email. You know, I, I'm human too, and I I, uh, I want to make sure everybody's questions get answered. So, uh, basic bed and Petra. Follow up again on the uh, question about experimental aircraft because we got such a, a positive answer <laughs> that it scares me. <laughs> uh, but I know Karen Stemwell was looking at that also. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Anybody who wants to get on the distribution list, if you will just drop me an email. Um, I will, that'll help me a lot because I'm not really uh, chat literate and I'm having to take this down and write it by hand. So drop me a, a email. Uh, and my contact information is on my Oh, slides. yeah, that's right. So uh, I will be happy to add you. Now, where do my questions go? That's okay. John, this is, this is Petra again. Um, would you restate that comment about experimental aircraft? Oh, I remember uh, last year or the year before you were asking yeah. if uh, uh, experimental aircraft yeah. were able to fly to Russia. And I had a very positive, affirmative answer um, that surprised. Oops. I think you're muted. Sorry. Right. You're. We're losing you when you turn away from the computer. Oh, <laughs> you're trying to help me find my yeah, questions. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, Petra, the short story is that we got a very positive uh, affirmative response when we looked at that last time. Uh, so much so that I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna verify it again because we have a, uh, at least one other experimental aircraft that wants to go as well. 
Okay. So. Yeah, because the issue was um, back in 2003, we had a uh, we had a Russian built Anatov of some sort that was an experimental aircraft in the U.S. and it was disallowed because it was not certificated as an experimental aircraft. It wasn't certificated, and so that I wonder if that requirement to be certificated has um, been resolved. Well, I, I uh, did in fact look into this back in, um, I forget it was 2000, yeah, it was 2019. And uh, the answer I got basically said that if it is a, a registered aircraft, you know, allowed to fly legally in the United States, it can fly legally in Russia also. Uh, you know, it was one of those answers that was too good to be true. So uh, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back and verify that again. Thank uh, you. And uh, I will certainly share with you and everybody else, you know, what I find. And hopefully I'll get some, some kind of references that we can all go look at personally as well. Uh, but I haven't forgotten that. And uh, we'll do some more research here. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let's see what else I've got here. Are there other questions? Let's see. Is the Russian, oh my God, that's going bad. I was reading, is the Russian vodka attached to or pasted? <laughs> okay. Uh, is the Russian visa attached or pasted into the passport? Yes, it is. It is physically attached to a page in the passport. So when you apply for it, you have to send your passport off. And when it comes back, it's, it's permanently affixed in there. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, listening in from Medford, Oregon, I made a note to add you to the list, but if you'll send me a, uh, or to send you the slides, if you'll shoot me an email, that would really be helpful. Um, okay, how can I get, okay, we talked about getting on the distribution list, just shoot me an email, your name, uh, if you tell me what you fly, I'm always interested in that, uh, but then a good email address, okay. Uh, my email address, uh, okay, uh, hopefully everybody has my email address now, and uh, Andy gave us uh, someone to check with too on the, uh, uh, on the basic ed, on the basic med stuff, so we, uh, we're already getting leads to get answers, okay, uh, we looked into it last year, oh, that's Karen, hey Karen, uh, and we're told the experimental category was not a problem. Karen Stemwell Petra uh, is with the Guiduck. I don't remember, don't know if you remember that uh, composite built uh, uh, goose imitation that's been at the trade show a couple of years. Uh, it's an experimental and she wanted to go and of course got canceled out too. So there's some more uh, confirmation from her. Um, I don't know if you've seen that plane, but that's a cool plane. Uh, okay, is there an absolute deadline when a go or no go decision will have to be made? Uh, my position has been that I'm, I'm going to revisit with, with my other organizers here, uh, Marshall, Dan, Tandy, and uh, probably the first week in March. And the reason is that if it looks very uncertain that we're going to go. Uh, we want to make sure we make that decision before people start spending non-refundable money. Um, I got a wonderful uh, email from Matt Gass today. They have a very generous uh, refund and cancellation policy. So, uh, uh, so I just I want to work closely with Tandy and make sure she gets what he, she needs, and also that uh, uh, we provide as much time as possible to make that go no go decision. But I'm thinking first week of March. Tandy, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, that sounds good. You okay. know, um, yeah, I think that's what we did last year. Was a it is yeah. yeah. So yeah, okay. Uh, we just don't get to talk much away from here, so I got to hear. Uh, <laughs> I want to be inclusive. Okay, thanks. So. Uh, so Keith, the answer is there's not an absolute deadline, but we're targeting the first week of March to, to visit that again. Okay, most experimental airplanes have limitations to state any foreign country must. Yeah, 
we are, uh, somebody said that most experimental airplanes have limitations in state. Any foreign country must provide permission. We will certainly make sure that uh, we don't send any uh, experimental planes without permission. So I noticed also earlier, I wanted to give a shout out to Warner. Uh, he's from Canada. He has been uh, with us for a couple of years now and I was glad to see you here tonight. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, it looks like that's all I've got right now and we're about out of time. We're actually about four minutes over time, that's okay. Are there any last questions? Okay, seeing none and hearing now, I'm really excited that we've got this much interest. Um, we've got an excellent group of uh, organizers here with Tandy and Marshall and Dan and Evgeny. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that if we're able to pull this off and uh, get through all the, the uh, unusual obstacles that we're facing this year, whoever goes is gonna have a fabulous time. Uh, and so we will uh, keep everybody informed and I'm more optimistic tonight. If you don't hear anything else hear that I'm more optimistic tonight than uh, I've been in quite a while here uh, based on some of the communication I've been getting. So uh, my last name, someone wants to know my last name, Scott. Uh, my last name is Dahlen, it's D-A-H-L-E-N. So, and I, I, I was born in Virginia and I loved it back in Virginia when the, Ladies would call my name and go, John Dolan. <laughs> but uh, that works for me. But I've been in Alaska for over 40 years now. So uh, that's kind of faded away. So uh, let's see. Just, and uh, John and Ruth, you're welcome. I'm glad that was informative. And uh, everybody, if you're in Anchorage, uh, I was contending with some black ice on the way over from Muldoon to Lake Hood. Uh, please stay safe and give yourself lots of room and remember that everybody else is out there driving like the roads are bone dry. <laughs> so, uh, everybody else around uh, who's here, thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. And we'll probably do another one of these get togethers in uh, about two or three weeks and I'll send an email out and Jackie will post it on our uh, social media. So thank you all very much and have a good night. Thank you. See you all. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.